In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In this program, entitled Learning to Live in the Divine Will, I wish to share with you Louisa's writings, The Servant of God, Louisa Picaretta, received over the course of 70-plus uh, years, the fruit of her obedience to ecclesiastical authorities and to the will of God. Louisa Picaretta submitted her writings to her spiritual director, Saint Anna Monte Francia, as well as to the director who followed him, namely Father Benedict Calvi, and she was guided by other ecclesiastical authorities to pass on to the church's hierarchy, namely those theologians that work for the congregations in Rome, um, these writings so that they may be acknowledged, sanctioned, and diffused throughout the church. In this segment, I'd like to address these writings in particular, the graces that they express and that Louisa received, so that in reading them, learning them, understanding them, listening to them, we in turn may receive them also. I spoke in previous, the last three previous segments about the graces given to Louisa of God's prime act, his internal operation known in Latin as ad intra operatio, and in participating in God's prime act, she participated in his one eternal operation. I spoke of these new graces, as well as the graces of the communicating and unifying virtue, whereby Louisa, in doing her divine acts and God's one eternal will, was able to impact and communicate to all creation glory, harmony, order, the order God put in it before sin, that was, that sin disordered, and unify all things in God. This communicating and unifying virtue binds all creation together. In God, in whom all things discover the divine order and harmony. Now, to reiterate this truth, I wish to share with you from volume 26, July 30th, 1929, the following excerpt of Jesus to Louisa. My daughter, what a difference there is between those who operate by the virtues in a saintly way, but in the human order, and those who operate by the virtues in the divine order of my will. Those who operate in a saintly way in the human order practice the virtues. Their virtues remain separated from each other, however, such that the diversity of their acts appears. One virtuous act appears of patience, another of obedience, and yet another of charity. Each of them is distinct, but in incapable of fusing together to form one single act that would otherwise lend itself to the divine will and embrace eternity and infinity. As for those who operate by the virtues in the divine order of my divine will, these souls have the communicating and unifying virtue, which makes them capable of accomplishing all of their virtues within the source of its light and of fusing the virtues together to form one single act with innumerable effects that embrace the Creator Himself with the infinity of His light. Our unifying strength possesses the communicating virtue in such a way that all creatures who so desire may partake of the blessings these souls place at everyone's disposal. Unquote. And now, today, I wish to share with you other graces that the divine will imparts to the soul conceived in sin, but desirous of receiving God's new outpouring of grace, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, 
in this third fiat of God's exfusion of grace, and the grace I wish to share with you today is that of transtemporality, universality, and a multiplication. Now, because God sustains all things and is present in all things in different ways, he is able to draw the soul that lives in his divine will into all things in which he is present. Now, God is present in all things, otherwise it would not exist. In theology, this is known as natural grace, that is, God's power sustaining all things in existence, keeping them in existence. So, for example, the very atomical level of things, their molecular structure, their atomic structure, would fall apart if God's natural grace were not sustaining them, keeping them together, as it were, this invisible, supernatural, emulsifying agent that keeps the molecules and atoms together in the grass, in the water, in the air, in all the elements and metals, in hydrogen, phosphorus, nitrogen, um, carbon, all these are kept together with bonds of natural grace. Okay. Now, God is present in a blade of grass, but he's more present in a baptized infant. God is baptized in a baptized infant, but he's more present than a baptized infant in an adult who's baptized and who has exercised the virtues, who has advanced in holiness. God is present in an adult who is exercising the Christian virtues, but he's more present in the Eucharist. See? So there are different modalities of God's presence in all things. Now, just because God is in all things and sustains all things in all ways, it doesn't mean that all things contain God equally. That would be pantheism. Rather, God is present in different degrees, in different ways, in different things. Louisa maintains that God empowers a soul who lives in his will to be present in all things by placing that soul in contact with all creatures of the past, present, and future, whereby it exercises a universal good within every creature. Inasmuch as Jesus' humanity, by transcending time, converges the past, present, and future to one single point and impacts the lives of all, likewise the soul that lives in the divine will. Remember, the soul who lives in the divine will possesses the same grace that Jesus possessed that enabled him to redeem all human generations in one lifetime. To Louisa, Jesus reveals this point of convergence as a dimension that is neither purely spiritual nor purely material, but a coalescing of the two that exceeds sensory experience. Such a reality is manifest in Louisa's acts in the divine will that emitted as rays of the sun the light of grace to all creation in a dimension Jesus refers to as existing between heaven and earth. Consider volume 12, April 7th, 1919, where Jesus reveals to Louisa, my, my daughter, as you did your acts in my will, many spiritual suns formed between heaven and earth. And I look at the earth only through these suns. Otherwise, to me, the earth would be so disgusting that I could not bear to look at it. But the earth receives few of these suns because the darkness that soul spread is so great that it places itself in front of these suns, and souls cannot receive all of their light or heat. Unquote. He also says something along these same lines in volume 15, April 2nd, 1923. So much like the sun that Louisa here refers to, or rather Jesus refers to, in the writings of Louisa, the divine acts that Louisa accomplished spread their effects throughout creation for the good of all, as they contained, in quotes, together all the acts of all creatures. That's right. Think of that for a moment. 
Louise's acts, whether it was breathing, praying, sacrificing, making reparation, talking, all the menial and less menial tasks, chores, acts she did in the body and soul, spread their effects throughout creation for the good of all and contained, that's right, these acts of hers contained, literally, all the acts of all creatures combined, impacting them for their own betterment. This uh, teaching comes from Volume 12, April 8, 1918. Now, by means of this grace of trans-temporality, trans-temporality means going through time. Trans, that means transit. Tempo, time. Going through time, trans-temporality. Um, by means of this grace God gave her, God's operation extended itself in her throughout the cosmos. Just as it extended in the soul of Adam and of the Blessed Virgin Mary, through their divine acts to all things throughout the universe, known and unknown. In volume 24, Jesus reveals this operation, this transtemporal grace at work in Adam on August 12, 1928. Jesus reveals, In Adam's operation I found all the hues of beauty, the fullness of love, admirable and unattainable mastery, and indeed everything and every one. Now, one who lives in my will reaches back to the act of innocent Adam and possesses the grace of universality in communicating to all the life and unifying virtue that he possessed. Thus, this soul possesses his act. Furthermore, the soul also reaches back to the acts of the Queen of Heaven and to those of its very Creator. And flowing in the acts of all and centralizing them within itself, it utters, Everything is mine, and I give everything to God. Unquote. Jesus gives a parallel teaching to Louise, and not just here in volume 24, but also in volume 21 on March 16th, 1927. So the Lord is basically telling Louisa through these excerpts that she is given a grace, the same grace that Adam and Eve possessed before sin, that the Virgin Mary possessed, who was conceived without sin and knew no sin throughout her life, and that Jesus himself possessed. By virtue of this unique Grace restored to wounded human nature for the first time in Louisa and to anyone who desires this gift after her, the gift of living in the divine. Well, that brings with it this transtemporal grace. To, to that individual, the same grace that sinless Adam and Eve, Mary and Jesus possess is given to them, whereby they can centralize within their own acts all creatures, known and unknown. Now, the soul can no more see the universal influence of its divine acts throughout creation than it can measure God's eternal light, or than it can cross the eternal light of God. Jesus reveals this to Louisa in volume 18, December 25th, 1925, as well as in volume 12, December 6th, 1917. Therefore, when a soul who receives the gift of living in God's will exercises this grace of transtemporality, thereby impacting all creatures and containing them within itself, within its own acts, its divine acts are acts of faith. They don't, the soul does not see the effects happening. They move mountains but do not see these mountains being moved, not in this life, but in the next. This is reserved for the beatific state, not for the intuitive state which we enjoy on earth, even in the divine will. So the grace of transtemporality disposes the soul for the grace of universality. This is a second grace. Remember I mentioned I will address the grace of transtemporality, but also universality, and multiplicity. 
Now, the grace of transtemporality disposes the soul for the grace of universality that exercises a universal sanctity in all things. In volume 16, August 20th, 1923, Jesus tells Louisa, My daughter, when a sanctity is individual, that is, given for a time and place, it displays many external prodigies in order to attract the individuals of that time and place, so that they may receive the grace and blessings which that sanctity contains. On the other hand, the sanctity of living in my will is not an individual sanctity, intended for the good of only a given place and time, or only for the people of that place and time. Rather, the sanctity of living in my will is one that produces benefits for the people of all times and all places. It is the sanctity that remains eclipsed in the eternal sun of my will. It enters into everyone and enlightens them all while remaining speechless. It enkindles everyone but without wood or the roar of flames or smoke. Despite all this, the sanctity of my will does not cease to be most majestic, the most beautiful and the most fruitful. Its light is the purest and its heat most intense. Its true image is found in the sun which illuminates the horizon. It enlightens while remaining speechless. It utters not a word to anyone and enlivens without clamor. The sanctity of living in my will is greater than the sun. A soul who is upright and fully ordered in my will is greater than an army in battle. Its intelligence is ordered and bound to my eternal intelligence. Its heartbeats, affections, and desires are ordered with eternal bonds. In this way, the soul's thoughts, acts, and indeed its whole interior are armies of messengers that emerge from it to fill heaven and earth as speaking voices, as weapons that defend, first of all, their God, and then all souls." Unquote. So, the grace of transtemporality engenders the grace of universality in all things. It, it exercises a universal sanctity in all things. And it is in this context that one may properly understand Louise's affirmation that living in the divine will is a gift, not principally intended for the sanctification of the individual, but for universal sanctification. For through it, with and in God's will, the soul administers to all rational creatures the grace that is necessary for receiving the gift of his divine will, and to irrational creatures the grace to be set free from its slavery to corruption and enjoy the glorious freedom of the sons of God that Paul refers to in his eighth chapter to the Romans. God's eternal operation and divine life in the soul who exercises the gift or the graces of transtemporality and universality are bilocated in the soul. God's eternal operation and divine life are bilocated in the soul. Consider the following excerpt from volume 24, December 5th, 1928. Louisa states, O oh, divine will, how admirable you are! You alone are the fructifier, the preserver, and the bilocator of the life of God in the creature. Unquote. So, the life of God is bilocated in the soul, and it is by virtue of God's life in the soul that the soul has the graces of exercising an influence on a universal and transtemporal level. God empowers the soul to bilocate in all other souls and dispose them 
to receive the life of Jesus who lived in the divine will. The soul's ability to trans-temporally and universally communicate grace to all souls and to created beings throughout the created universe suggests a diffusion and multiplication of its divine acts in all things, hence the grace of multiplication. This grace of multiplication empowers the soul to continuously multiply to the infinite and in every instant its act for as many acts of grace God unleashes upon creation. I'm going to share with you a lengthy excerpt, but it's well worth the read, for it conveys this very principle of the soul's ability to multiply to the infinite and in every instant its act. For as many acts of grace God unleashes upon creation. This comes from Volume 12, February 2nd, 1921. Jesus reveals, My daughter, surely the creative power exists in my will. Billions and billions of stars came forth from within our single fiat. Billions and billions of acts of grace which communicate themselves to souls, come forth from within the fiat mihi of my mother, from which redemption began. These acts of grace are more beautiful, more brilliant, and more varied than the stars. For while the stars are fixed and do not multiply, the acts of grace multiply to infinity. They excel in every instant, attracting all souls by delighting them, strengthening them, and giving them life. If men could only see the supernatural order of grace, they would hear such harmonies and behold such an enchanting scene as to believe that such is their paradise. Now the third fiat, too, must excel together with the other two fiats. It must multiply to infinity, and in every instant it must offer itself for as many acts of grace that are brought forth from my womb. For as many acts as there are stars, as there are drops of water, as there are created things brought forth by the fiat of creation. The third fiat must merge with the other two fiats and say, I accomplish as many acts as you have accomplished. These three fiats have the same value and power. As you disappear in me, you allow this fiat to act, and thus you too can say in my omnipotent fiat, I want to create as much love and offer as many adorations, blessings, and glory to my God as there are acts of grace to make up for everyone and everything. Your acts will fill heaven and earth. They will multiply themselves with the acts of creation and redemption and will become one. Unquote. So, from this excerpt, it can be gleaned that the soul who lives in the divine will possesses the grace to multiply to the infinite, and in every instant its acts, for as many acts of grace God unleashes upon creation. That means it multiplies the acts of God in creation and in redemption, through the outpouring of the fiat of sanctification, such that all things of the universe continuously increase in accidental glory and beauty. By this means, the soul offers God the complete glory of creation that he should have received from all creatures if there had been no sin. Now, I spoke of the graces of Transtemporality, universality, and multiplication that are bequeathed to the soul who lives in the divine will. These are new graces that have been withheld, suspended, Jesus says, for 
6,000 years from wounded human nature. God began to outpour these graces once again, beginning with Louisa and continuing until his final return in glory. The souls who desire to live in his will dispose themselves to receive this grace, or rather, allow God to dispose them through their receptivity of his grace. By living in the state of grace, by desiring the gift of his will with an upright intention and firm desire, they allow God to dispose themselves to receive these graces. And there are more graces. I've enumerated in my doctoral dissertation approved by Rome 33 new graces that are given to the soul who lives in the divine will and that had been suspended for 6,000 years. That is, from the time of Adam's expulsion from Eden, beginning with original sin, to the time in which these graces were restored in a creature conceived in sin, namely Luisa Picaretta. Now, the next grace I'd like to elaborate upon is that of the soul's expansion. This is something that may appear new to us, but really it's not. That the soul is capable of expanding is found in the writings of Augustine, fourth century teacher. It's found in the writings of John of the Cross and other saints. So, even though this ability of the soul is not new, what is new is its ability to expand in the divine will, impacting all creatures of all time. Let me explain. Through its repeated acts of love for God, it, in and through creation, the soul expands and enlarges its capacity to receive a greater sharing in his divine quality. Much like Mary, the Virgin Mary, who proclaimed that her soul magnifies the Lord. The soul that lives in the divine will magnifies the Lord within itself by expansion. St. Ambrose poignantly illustrates the parallel of Mary and the soul's ability to magnify and increase the Lord's presence within itself. Consider the following excerpt from Ambrose taken from uh, a work he wrote on an exposition on the Gospel of Luke. In Latin, it's entitled Expositio Evangelii Secundum Lucan. And it was the tenth book. All right. And here he states, Remaining pure and free from sin, the soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, just as Mary's soul magnified the Lord and her spirit rejoiced in God her Savior. In another place we read, Magnify the Lord with me. The Lord is magnified not because the human voice can add anything to God, but because he is magnified within us. Christ is the image of God, and if the soul does what is right and holy, it magnifies that image of God, in whose likeness it was created, and in magnifying the image of God, the soul has a share in its greatness and is exalted. Unquote. Now, Louisa exemplifies the soul's expansion through its prevenient and present acts. The prevenient act is the morning offering in the divine will, which the soul makes at the first rising of the day. It's an act of consecrating every single breath, thought, word, action, joy, sorrow throughout the day to God to impact all creatures of all time. It fixes its will in this moment in God and resolves to operate only in his will. It anticipates all of its acts throughout the day in this morning offering by forming the intention to fuse itself in God's will. It, its acts then flow in God in that very moment in God's one eternal operation, that having neither beginning nor end, elevates and diffuses the soul's acts throughout creation such that they impact immediately the lives of all and progressively enclose the acts of all creatures of the past, present and future to increase their accidental glory and beauty. Now, on account of 
distractions throughout the day, self-esteem, negligence. This morning offering, this prevenient act of the soul may be rendered less effective. Therefore, Jesus exhorts Louisa to renew this prevenient act throughout the day. And the soul renews this act during the day with its present act, to expand the prevenient act, to magnify it. To Louisa, Jesus reveals that both the prevenient and present acts are necessary for living in the divine will. The prevenient act disposes and admits the soul to live in God's will throughout the day, while the present act maintains and expands, magnifies the soul in that same will. Louisa accomplished both of these acts through two movements of her soul. To better illustrate this interior dynamic in Louisa, her first interior movement may be called general and the second particular. Now, let's begin with general. In this general motion of her soul, movement of her soul, she offered to God the love, praise, and thanksgiving of and for all creatures at once. Her second interior movement is particular, whereby she offered to God all things individually, or in little groups or clusters, the acts of all humans, the motions of the stars, the murmuring of the winds, of the trees, and so forth. Now, to better illustrate, I'm going to share with you a prayer taken from the various extrapola extrapolations of Louisa's text that accompanied her daily, prevenient, and present acts. It begins as follows. O Immaculate Heart of Mary, Mother and Queen of the Divine Will, I entreat you by the infinite merits of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and by the graces God has granted to you since your Immaculate Conception, the grace of never going astray. Most Sacred Heart of Jesus, I am a poor and unworthy sinner, and I beg of you the grace to allow our Mother to form in me the divine acts you purchased for me and for every creature. These acts are the most precious of all, for they carry the eternal power of your fiat, and they await my yes, your will be done, fiat voluntas tua. So I implore you, Jesus and Mary, to accompany me as I now pray. I am nothing. God is all. Come, divine will. Come, Heavenly Father, to beat in my heart and to act in my will. Come, Jesus, to flow in my body and to think in my mind. Come, Holy Spirit, to breathe in me and to stir my memory to recall God's blessings. I fuse myself in the divine will and place my I love you, I adore you, and I bless you, God, in the fiat of creation. With my I love you, my soul bilocates in the creations of the heavens and the earth. I love you in the stars, in the sun, in the moon, and in the skies. I love you in the earth, in the waters, and in every living creature my Father created out of love for me, so that I may return love for love. I now enter into Jesus' most holy humanity that embraces all acts. I place my I adore you, Jesus, in your every breath, heartbeat, thought, word, and step. I adore you in the sermons of your public life, in the miracles you performed, in the sacraments you instituted, and in the most intimate fibers of your heart. I bless you, Jesus, in your every tear, blow, wound, thorn, and in each drop of blood that unleashed light for the life of every human. I bless you in all your prayers, reparations, offerings, and in each of the interior acts 
and pains you suffered up to your last breath on the cross. I enclose your life and all your acts, Jesus, with my I love you, I adore you, and I bless you. I now enter into the acts of my mother Mary. I place my I thank you in Mary's every thought, word, and action. I thank you in the embraced joys and sorrows of Jesus' fiat of redemption and of the Holy Spirit's fiat of sanctification. Fused in your acts, I make my I thank you and I bless you flow in the relations of every creature to fill their acts with light and life, to fill the acts of Adam and Eve, of the patriarchs and prophets, of the souls of the past, present, and future, of the holy souls in purgatory, of the holy angels and saints. I now make these acts my own, and I offer them to you, my tender and loving Father, May they increase the glory of your children, and may they glorify, satisfy, and honor you on their behalf. Let us now begin our day with our divine acts fused together. Thank you, Most Holy Trinity, for enabling me to enter into union with you by means of prayer. May your kingdom come, and your will be done on earth, as it is in heaven. Fiat. Well, with this prayer, the soul who lives in the will of God or desires to live therein accompanies God throughout the cosmos through its provenient and present acts. And in so doing, it deposits within itself the divine acts of Jesus' humanity, which contains the acts of all creatures. Try Christ's humanity contain the act of all creatures of all time. Consider the following excerpt taken from volume 18, December 6th, 1925, where Jesus tells Louisa, My daughter, the true living of my supreme will is precisely this. I must find everyone and everything in the soul substance. All that came from my will for the good of souls and of creation must be bound within the soul with its love. By living in my will with its response of love, the soul is bound, and in possession of all that I, that my will accomplished, and yet will accomplish in other souls. But this is not all. Not only must I find all creation in the soul, but the true living in my will finds everyone. That is why I must find in the soul, as in act, holy Adam, just as he came forth from my creative hands, as well as guilty Adam, humiliated and weeping, so that the soul may be bound to him in the state of sanctity, and taking part in his innocent and holy acts, offer me glory and make all creation smile in you. I must find in the soul the prophets, the patriarchs, and the Holy Fathers, along with all of their acts. And if these personages longed for the Redeemer, you will long for the supreme fiat as the triumph and fulfillment of their sighs. In the soul I want to find my inseparable mother along with all of her acts, in which my will worked so many portents and ennobled her to enjoy its full dominion. And I want to find my entire being along with all of my acts. In sum, I want to find in the soul all of my qualities, all that belongs to me, and all that my supreme will has done and will do because these constitute all that which is inseparable from me, whence it is just and necessary that they become inseparable from the soul who lives in my will. So, if I do not find everything in the soul, it cannot be said that the soul lives completely in my will. Unquote. 
So here the Lord is sharing with Louisa that there are different ways to live in His will, but nonetheless, those souls live in His will. Some on the surface, some emerging, emerging, emerging themselves more, some completely immersed to the point of losing themselves entirely. Now, one may think in listening to this excerpt, how is it possible for me to contain all these acts, especially of Jesus and the Blessed Mother, that no human being can ever equal in sanctity? How is it possible for me to contain their acts when I can never be as holy as they are? And the answer is simple, more simple than you think. We don't do anything. God does it in us even to our unawares. What we are to focus on, and this is what Jesus tells Louisa, is doing her acts in the divine will. That is, at the beginning of every day and throughout the day, renewing the offering of her entire being to God's divine will, whereby everything throughout the day, known and unknown, is consecrated to him to impact all creatures for their glory and God's accidental glory. So, at the beginning of the day, we offer to God our fiat. We give Him our will. That's how simple it is. And throughout the day, we renew it. Of course, we live a life of steadfast prayer, of reception of the sacraments, meditation, things like that. So, the approach is very is not much different than the approach of the saints of the past. We exercise the Christian virtues. The exterior is the same. What's different is the interior. In the interior, we offer, not knowing where this offering is going beyond God, our will to God, and all our thoughts, words, and actions, joys, and sorrows, and God takes that, and He multiplies it and diffuses it throughout the crea creation, the cosmos, impacting all creatures of all time, known and unknown to us. And that embraces the acts of Mary, the acts of Jesus, the acts of others. Now, I mentioned earlier, Louisa had two movements of her soul. One was general, one was particular. So the way in which she offered her fiat to God in a general way was a broad sweep that impacted all creatures of all time and their acts. Then she was also exhorted by Jesus to exercise this movement of her soul in a particular way, that is, particularly for the acts of Adam, the acts of the patriarchs, the acts of the prophets, the acts of the virgin, and she would do that. So she would pause from the general offering occasionally and do the particular offering for this or that particular person, including their acts. And we're exhorted to do the same. Can always in consideration of our obligations in life. Remember, Louisa had the whole day to do this at her disposal. She was bedridden. Many of us do not. In fact, the vast majority of us do not. We have to work, we have to tend to our finances, our family relations, our moral obligations, our domestic obligations, our children, our grandchildren, whatever that may be. And this is what God wants. He does not want us to follow the same pattern of Louisa, that is, of being bedridden all day and doing nothing but praying, offering up ourselves in immolation 24-7, focus exclusively on God alone. God has called us to share that focus with other people in whom God exists. So we are to worship God in and through our neighbor and creation. This is known as the rounds in the divine will. And Louisa did this too, even though she was alone, unlike us, for most of her day, and was in meditation for all the day, she always exercised the virtues through her neighbor. The people that came to meet her in the afternoon, she would converse with and teach the hours of the Passion to, and she would teach them how to sew as well. And this is how she exercised the Christian virtues, but she also exercised the divine virtues. That is, the virtues that were not subjected to places or times. And these divine virtues were when she was doing her rounds throughout creation, when she was sacrificing herself in the state of victimhood, that is, suffering to avert a calamity or chastisement or to save souls from hell. She was offering up these sufferings for all souls of all time and mitigating the chastisements of all time. 
In fact, Jesus told Louise on one occasion, only two creatures in the history of mankind have preserved the earth from destruction, and those two creatures are the Virgin Mary and Louisa. So, our acts in the divine will, if they are to become an expression of love, must embrace the life of God with every act we do, whereby the soul is enlarged, it is expanded, it is augmented, it is increased, to the point at which it can contain God himself and the entirety of all the acts Jesus' humanity contained. Louisa succeeded in doing that, and so did Mary. Now suppose you don't, or someone doesn't succeed in containing all the acts of all creatures, but let's say 90%, or maybe some 30%, or some 12%. Does that mean they're not living in the divine will? Of course not. Jesus makes that clear to Louisa. But to live completely, the adjective completely in the divine will means the soul must contain all the acts of all creatures. It can live in the divine will incompletely, but still it's living in the divine will. That is in the state of grace, impacting all creatures with its every thought, word, and action, progressively in depositing within their soul all the acts of all creatures, whereby the soul expands and whether or not they succeed before they die in this life to ex contain all creatures or the acts of all creatures or not is not as important as living in the divine will and impacting all creatures. Both is better, but one is good. Okay? And uh, the, the mystery of all this is that these acts, divine acts, that impact all creatures and expand the soul and enable us to deposit within our soul all creatures are acts of faith. We don't see where they go. We don't know who we're impacting all the time. And this is where faith comes in. With the soul's prayer that accompanies its prevenient act, its present acts, whereby its soul expands, the soul deposits within itself the divine acts of Jesus' humanity, which contains the acts of all creatures. Okay. And the soul's act of depositing the acts of all, Jesus' humanity, the acts of all creatures, is predicated on God's having granted to it the grace and capacity to contain the fullness of the eternal operation of the divine will and share in God's eternal operation, Adintra. Consider, the, well, I won't share it with you, it's a long excerpt, but this is found in volume 16 on June 6th, 1924, and another excerpt, like volume 11, March 17th, 1914, volume 16, November 24th, 1923, and so forth. So the soul is given by God the grace and capacity to contain these acts. In the soul's repeated acts in the divine will throughout the day, it progressively restores and establishes God's divine order in creation and grows in his divine qualities. This is revealed in volume 13, September 14, 1921. Jesus tells Louisa, My daughter, each time the soul does its acts in my will, it grows more and more before me in wisdom, goodness, power, and beauty. Indeed, as the soul keeps repeating its acts in my will, the more infusions it receives of wisdom, goodness, and all else, and it grows by means of my food, with which it nourishes itself. This is why in the Holy Gospels it is written that I grew in wisdom before God in men. As I, God, grew, sorry, let me rephrase that, as God, I could neither grow nor decrease. My growth was only in my humanity, which 
growing in age, came to multiply my acts in the supreme will. In each additional act I accomplished, I was an ad- I accomplished an additional growth in the wisdom of my heavenly Father. This growth of mine was so real that other creatures noticed it. Each one of my acts excelled in the immense sea of the divine will, and as I operated, I nourished myself with this heavenly food. And the same thing happens to the soul who lives in my will. Unquote. So here God enlarges the soul's capacity by infusing within it singular graces, that is, the grace to contain, and the capacity to contain God and all of his acts, that is, Jesus' humanity, the grace of trans-temporality, universality, multiplicity. And since the human being cannot exhaust the outpouring of God's grace, for the graces associated with this gift are poured into the soul progressively and ongoingly, without ending, even into eternity. God's will floods the soul and over, over, overwhelms it. He overflows above and below the soul to the right and to the left. But despite the soul's limitations, God progressively increases his eternal operation in it by expanding it magnifying it so that it may partake of God's unending will in degrees. All right, in the next segment, I will address the soul's voids. The word void is found very often in Louisa's volumes. It's also found in the mystical literature of St. John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, and other mystical writers. And I would like to expound upon this term and explain why Jesus uses it in Louisa's writings in relation to Adam and to others who desire to receive this gift. I also encourage you to continue to support Radio Maria and this broadcasting so that programs like this may continue to enrich you spiritually, morally, intellectually, so that your conscience may be formed, so that with an upright and formed conscience you may follow God's will and live in it and rediscover it in eternity. So I will talk about the voids in Adam, in us, and how by filling these voids we come to fill ourselves with God himself. Louisa was a simple Italian girl who did not know these terms. By her schooling, by her parents, by her associates or relatives, many of these expressions she uses, vuoto, dell'anima, a void in the soul, came directly from Jesus. Other words she was never exposed to as well, if not only from Jesus, like from eternity in Latin, ab, ab eterno or the internal operation of God, ad intero operatio, and other expressions, which further display the source behind these writings, namely, God. They could not come from Louisa herself. In her writings, therefore, she uses this term void to signify a spiritual place within Adam's soul also known as an invisible, invisible void. Okay, I will talk about that in the next segment, as well as the spiritual caverns that were found in Adam's soul, known as voids in the plural. There was an invisible void, singular, but there were also voids, plural, found in Adam. And they're distinct. And they're also found in us as well. And... um, Inasmuch as the soul is obliged to love God continuously throughout its life, the voids that God puts in us are unfulfilled and they're only filled with our acts in God, in His will. When we die and God finds some of these voids still empty, He will allow us 
to pass first through purgatory before we get to heaven to fill these voids there, without merit, however. On earth, we can fill them with merit. So now is the time to avail ourselves of this gift. All right, so before getting ahead of myself, I will continue this chapter on voids in the next talk. For now, let us pray together in the words our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you. The Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.